Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a great RightsCon. My name is Brahan Taye. I'm a researcher that investigates the relationship between technology and social justice and a senior advisor at Internews. Thank you so much for choosing to join our session today amongst all of the competing and super interesting sessions. So we're really excited to have this conversation uh, with all of you today. And of course, I'm here today with Vijaya Gade. She's the head of legal policy and trust at Twitter. Um, so basically, she is the person you'd want to talk to at RightsCon uh, and sort of follow around to get all your legal policy and trust related questions answered. Jaya, well, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Um, I know uh, there are a lot of people asking a lot of questions today, so we'll be definitely doing that. Just a bit of a housekeeping participants, please use the chat um, in your comment um, and for your comments and questions. If time allows, I promise I'll try to include some of the super interesting questions here. So welcome, Vijay. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to, to be here um, celebrating the 10 year anniversary of RightsCon and to um, have a great conversation with all of you. Awesome. Where are you joining us today? I'm sitting out of Nairobi. It's 5.15 p.m. for me. Uh, I'm in uh, San Francisco and, and I believe it's about 7.15 a.m. But I'm still excited to be here. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I, ho I hope you've had tea or uh, coffee, whichever one is your poison. Great. So um, uh, the first conversation definitely is going to be about content moderation, obviously. Uh, so, um, uh, so I can start with some of my personal experiences with uh, using Twitter's uh, content moderation. So I'm Ethiopian. I've done a lot of content moderation issues on Ethiopia related stuff. And using the platform is super frustrating because we never get a response on the content that's reported or, you know, it's delayed. I've gotten a response after four months the other day. I had even forgotten what I had reported. So that's sort of the sort of the background that I'm coming from. So we're seeing numerous social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter and others sort of try to globalize content moderation, which, you know, which would seem I, I wish my content could be treated the same way as the content in the US at some point. But some of the problems that we're seeing is that, you know, in this effort to globalize content moderation, um, vulnerable voices, dissenting voices, marginalized groups are being, um, um, you know, silenced and censored, whether on purpose or, you know, automatically, we're not yet sure. Um, so how does Twitter sort of mitigate for that in the effort to, to sort of globalize globalize um, content moderation and uh, I was just wanting to add on there as well we've heard rumors that you know Twitter is um, sort of trying to come up with its first governance for global content moderation I wouldn't think don't have to address that particularly but how are you mitigating for the risks of you know folks like myself being silenced and marginalized on your platforms yeah thank you it's a great question I think this is one of the the long-term um, issues that I'm spending a lot of time trying to understand where does this go from here? Because I think we definitely have challenges today. I think as an industry, content moderation and scaling that to meet the needs of our customers around the world is becoming enormously difficult. Um, certainly we, taking a step back, we're trying to protect some fundamental human rights here, right? We're really focused on free expression, but we're also focused on safety and privacy. These are all very interrelated. And whenever you make any sort of change to your policy or enforcement, you have to think of all of these things and how they're balancing each other. And I think one of the challenges we faced, obviously, in the last year is also having to do this very differently than we've had to in the past, um, you know, just to be perfectly candid, like we we had um, content moderators globally that were very much affected by the, the global pandemic. And we had to make some big adjustments either to how they were working and where they were working. And um, it definitely, you know, did not allow us to be as um, fast as we wanted to be as react as um, you know de uh, as deliberate as we wanted to be in dealing with situations in certain places around the world I think that's one part of it the other part of it is absolutely I'm not going to sit here and tell you that our cap capacity to do things in English is is the same as it is in every other language that is something we need to work on and I think part of our push as a company to build um, technology hubs in the places in the world where we serve our customers is very much focused on this issue. We cannot possibly have either um, ranking algorithms or safety algorithms that work in these places the way they are intended to work unless we have people coming from these communities who understand the nuance and the cultural context who can help us build the product in a way that we want it to work. So I think we have a lot of work to do. Part of this is really reaching out and being in those communities and investing more resources. Um, so there's there's definitely a lot, um, I think, that we have to improve. And it's very much on my mind. But beyond that, I think 
Um, as a community, we also have to grapple with how to do content moderation in this world. And I think that there's going to be some really interesting conversations and questions, hopefully, on that topic, too. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, I relate like to the question of, you know, how do we, how do we do content governance and, you know, content moderation for the whole world is, is, I guess, the question that you're, you know, you're faced with every day and it's super challenging. There's no single framework that that serves everyone. Um, so, uh, you know, just just trying to think about this, how it happens in real life from the background, because you're um, head of, um, you know, legal policy and safety. So these are the questions that I'm sure you ask yourself every day. So you definitely want to tap into this a bit more. So now looking at, for instance, um, not, not necessarily the lack of content moderation, but the content moderation that's actually being done currently. So if you look at this, the recent case of Palestinian voices being uh, you know, silenced, and I will definitely come out and say, I know from many Palestinian partners, Twitter has been the most responsive to request, so that's really appreciated and that's that's super important. But the idea that, you know, uh, what I'm struggling with, with, with the content moderation work that I do is that my content, the content that we report is not being taken down. Others like Palestinian voices, what they're struggling with is the fact that their content is being, you know, taken down in mass. So how does that happen? What, like, what is that technical error? What does that mean? Yeah, I think in the situation, what we saw in Palestine was obviously um, the, the situation on the ground was so dynamic and people were jumping to Twitter and other social platforms to report what was happening. And we have a bunch of algorithms in place that are meant to detect spam or uh, unusual usage of accounts that, you know, obviously in other situations are very good at protecting our customers because there's there is signals of um, some sort of misuse or, or other uh, behavior that we wouldn't want to see on the platform. And in this situation, those algorithms were catching legitimate accounts that, that were obviously acting in different ways because of the emerging situation on the ground. So that, that's very, like, that's an unintended consequence. I think that that's quite common. And um, unfortunately, like, I, I would love to tell you that we will never run into these type of issues, but we're always learning these um, algorithms or even human processes are meant to be uh, updated and they're meant to change over time as we learn from our situations on the ground. And in, in this particular situation, it's the worst possible timing for, for the people on the ground, obviously. I understand that. And our team was jumping in, trying to uh, fix the situation, but we don't always have the capability of just turning something off in one particular area because it has massive impact across of our platform. So I know that our team was um, you know, trying to understand the specific impacts in this case, reaching out to our civil society partners on the ground, understanding very much who was being impacted and trying to um, undo essentially the effects that we were seeing from the use of that, those particular um, spam related or other related algorithms. And um, I, I, again, we've learned a lot and we're, we're now gonna work with our product and engineering teams um, to see how we can mitigate that impact from happening in the future, because obviously it wasn't something that we intended or foresaw um, in that moment. Um, that's super interesting, and I, I was hoping the algorithm conversation was not going to come today, but <laughs> it's here. Um, so, what does that really mean? Because I'm, 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 I'm trying to understand. So, when we say, you know, um, I'm, I'm assuming there's a code that somebody sat down and wrote, um, you know, that automatically, you know, it's, 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 it almost seems like it's by design that, uh, you know, it's not able to tell the, you know, the realities of Palestinians. Is it that, you know, um, it's designed to block, filter, censor content that's particularly related to this? situations like how would you how would you explain the algorithm because we can't just use the algorithm and leave it like that so somebody must have written it right like somebody sat there thought about it how does how does that work yeah. so if you think if you take a step back we have a lot of um algorithms that are attempting to detect inauthentic behavior so this is um spam like behavior bots fake accounts and these accounts behave in certain ways right, either in terms of how much they're tweeting or who they're tweeting to or how they're engaging or the fact that they will suddenly start doing something. And so we have, um, I guess, detection mechanisms, these are the algorithms, that are looking for this type of behavior. It's not coded to content. It's not code. I mean, we have some that are obviously coded to content, but in this situation, it was about behavior, looking at behavior models. And what these algorithms do is they won't often just directly um, say like this account is gone, but they will put uh, they will put some challenges in front of the account to make sure they're human, as an example. So it will be some sort of authentication mechanism to you know provide an email address, a phone number, do some sort of recaptcha, 
And this is all intended, again, you know, for the safety of the whole platform. But in any individual case, we can be making errors and stopping someone from accessing the system as quickly as they need to. So it's not that this was an algorithm put in place for Palestine um, or for the situation. These are longstanding behavior-based algorithms that are looking for certain types of behavior that in our experience in the past, have been inauthentic or fake or bot-like or automated. And in you know, they're not going to be a hundred percent accurate. And in certain situations, the behaviors are going to mimic something that's happening in that isn't bad. And the algorithm is going to detect it as bad and make take action on it. So I think that's the closest um, explanation I can give to this particular situation. It wasn't um, that we put in some something in place for uh, what we were seeing in Palestine. These were things that we had already had in place that were operating globally, which is also why it's not really possible for us to just disable this algorithm because it does have um, important functions that it's serving in other parts of the world. It's just not particularly working in this moment um, for this. And we have learnings to, to understand how to improve and fix that in the future. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, so uh, sort of that, that brings up, you know, issues of, for instance, uh, when mass rallies are organized in different places, we don't see that sort of um, action from you guys, you know, from Twitter uh, blocking, um, you know, whether it's protests, you know, in the US or, you know, in the UK or other places. So maybe contextualizing to that need and knowing that these protests are coming might uh, potentially help. But I'll, I'll make sure that I move us to um, sort of the next question of, uh, we know that uh, numerous governments are at, an, at an alarming rate, really uh, trying to regulate Big tech, uh, I know you guys have been busy with blockings in Nigeria, block, you know, your uh, colleagues and, you know, um, content, content uh, governments trying to sort of regulate content online, which is not always the best uh, job for governments to do, demanding physical presence of individuals and companies, you know, intimidation of uh, your employees and, you know, other social media employees as, as well being intimidated. So it's a really difficult time uh, to be uh, running policy legal and safety at any content hosting company, content posting, company, you know, uh, all of those things. So a uh, first question for you is, you know, how are you trying to balance between the market interest um, and freedom of expression, privacy and safety of its users? Yeah, I would just like to say, like, um, it is a tough time to be a company, but it's always been a tough time to be an activist. So I don't think that um, what, what we're facing today is probably a very small fraction of what many of you see day to day. And, um, you know, we're, we're um, humbled to, to be able to fight for things that we believe in as a company, whether it's free expression or privacy or safety. And I think the important thing for us as we're making some of these decisions to um, either enter markets is, is to really be as transparent as we can be. Um, for us, there's a lot of accountability that comes from transparency. That's why our systems are designed the way they are. We still process uh, government legal requests and publish them publicly um, on a third party site uh, through Lumen. Um, we think that transparency is important. We provide user notice when we get these requests um, to the extent that we can. That's obviously really important. Um, but this is definitely a big challenge um, for all companies. And I think um, one of the things that I have found to be really interesting is there is this debate that's happening about the role of corporations, power of corporations um, in these very governance-like matters. And one of the arguments we we get or one of the pushbacks that we see when we're advocating for free expression in, in different markets is that, you know, we're a corporation. What do we really care about people? And, um, you know, our voice is not as influential in a lot of these discussions as I would like them to be, because people feel that we're not um, the right, um, I guess, voice or the right champion for some of these causes. So I think the other thing that's really important for me here is to have a really strong partnership with civil society because uh, your voices representing the actual citizens in many of these countries are going to be much more influential, um, I think, than our voices as uh, a corporation and, and at that seen as an American corporation in a lot of these situations. Um, yeah, I wish in reality that was, that was true. I wish our, our voices were much more powerful than, you know, multi-billion dollar corporations like you guys. But um, so just, one to, of these, just, I mean, just to hit on that, like it's not the power I appreciate, like in a lot of these markets that civil society groups have very little power. But one of the things the government cannot say to you is you're not you don't belong to us like you're not of us. 
Whereas we get that argument a lot, right? Like, what do you know about what the people of this country need? Like, you you don't represent us. You represent some other constituent. And I think that's why it's important to have this as a partnership, because we do have influence. We have some leverage, right? Like, we it's not that we have none. And we can and we are trying to use that to advocate for a free, free and open Internet. That's the most important thing that we do. I mean, that's fundamentally the purpose of Twitter is to, to have uh, to provide a space for a public conversation. And we can't possibly do that globally unless there's a free and open Internet. So we're going to use that leverage and that power to advocate for those things. But us doing that without the partnership of civil society, I think, is going to be really meaningless. Um, True, I couldn't agree more. I, I think uh, definitely civil society definitely does play a role. So this, so just in terms of going back to this idea of you know the open internet and what you advocate for, what we're seeing, for instance, in India um, currently, uh, you know, the challenge that Twitter and other social media platforms are having is uh, is quite concerning. So Twitter has indicated, indicated numerous times that it receives government requests that are unlawful beyond the country's right framework, uh, you know, um, and. There's there's a lot of you know dangerous precedents being set in other Asian countries that we're also really worried about happening in India. So, uh, when are you guys going to really you know walk the talk on this issue and really go to court in India and and tell the government to back off? Well, I think we are walking the talk. I mean, if you look at um, you know we've we've uh, declined there are a number of orders that you know we've been very um, open with that we don't agree that we think that. Um, they uh, violate Indian law as well as international law, and that they're, you know, uh, targeting um, very particular um, activists or journalists or uh, opposition political parties. And we feel that they um, aren't in compliance with Indian law. So I think we are, and we those those accounts and those tweets um, in many instances remain on the platform. Um, so obviously, it's a very delicate. Um, uh, balance to draw of when you want to actually be in a court um, versus when you want to negotiate and um, try to, um, uh, you know, really make sure that the government understands the perspective that you're bringing. Um, because I do think you can lose a lot of control when you end up in the litigation. Um, you certainly don't have, um, you don't know what's going to happen. And I think that that's one of the challenges is, you know, stepping back and looking at this from a purely legal perspective is, um, litigation is one tool, and it's not always the best tool. It's a very blunt tool, and um, you don't. If you don't know the outcome, you can be taking some pretty big risks with your enforcement and your policy. And um, I think what we're trying to do is make sure that we we have the flexibility um, to continue to operate in the market, continue to enforce our rights um, and the rights of the people using our service and do that in a way that gives us the maximum flexibility. Of course, if it comes to it, we're not going to hesitate to make sure that that um, we enforce that in a way that um, we have to, but we still feel like there's room to really understand um, the various positions here and come to perhaps an understanding um, on some of these issues. And I think the most important thing is here is an open dialogue, because if you don't have any dialogue at all, there's not a, a mechanism even for advocating for the things that are important to us. Yeah, thank you for that. So, um, you know, what does that conversation and, you know, um, um, negotiation with the government look like? So um, would you, um, does that come at the cost of, you know, losing um, um, Twitter as a market? Because that's, you, uh, you know, uh, India as a market is not, I'm assuming you guys would not want to lose India as a market. So uh, if you're not going to court and if you're going to sort of negotiate and try to see what is workable with the government, that means that comes at the expense of, you know, marginalized voices, you know, uh, women and minority groups um, and, you know, freedom of expression, privacy and all of those things. So that uh, that really is like creates a lot of anxiety amongst many of the marginalized groups that are in India that are fighting, um, you know, the government on many levels. So what does that what does that negotiation look like? Well, look, I think part of this is um, making sure the government itself is understanding what they're asking for, because in, in a lot of instances you have, um, you know, people who might be enforcing a particular law in a particular way, but that may not be necessarily what someone more senior in the government is understanding what's happening or really informed about how that's happening. So it, on some level, it is purely an education. Like, are you aware that this is the nature of these orders? Are you aware that this is um, the, the groups that it happens to be targeting? Um, can you give us more information on why 
this is um, not only a violation of our rules, but why you think it's a violation of Indian law. Like engaging in that conversation has resulted in many instances around the world of governments understanding like or uh, admitting like that wasn't the intention um, or, you know, pulling back in, in particular ways. And I think calling a spotlight or putting a spotlight on these issues and making sure people really understand or governments really understand um, how their laws are being interpreted and enforced in particular situations can be really important. I agree. I share with you the concern that there is no easy path here. There is no path where we can do everything that we want without understanding government interests or civil society interests. I wish that there was something easier for us to do, but I think we're also balancing wanting to be available um, for the people um, that use our service in these markets with um, free expression rights, with privacy rights. And so these are enormous challenges, not just for us, but for the open internet. And I, I think it's we're going to see a lot of changes. And I think this regulation of social platforms by the government is really going to push the industry in a very different direction of more decentralization. And this is I think going to be largely better for a lot of activists, for a lot of people, uh, but it re represents a whole new set of challenges that we're going to have to grapple with uh, when we move to perhaps a more decentralized internet once again, because obviously centralizing a lot of these points um, uh, with companies like us is going to create a lot of problems for a lot of people and it gives governments um, venues to figure out how to regulate and control the internet in ways that perhaps they couldn't if it were more decentralized. Um, okay, so and now going back to the, this issue of, you know, um, you're facing challenge in, in India, and then now if we come to countries like Nigeria, where, um, you know, last week or this week, it's been a long week, <laughs> Twitter was blocked. Um, and, you know, there were many justifications the government gave for why Twitter um, was blocked. We're seeing, you know, year after year, governments shutting down the internet, uh, blocking, filtering, filtering social media. And, you know, of course, Twitter has been um, sort of at the front of this. And, you know, I definitely want to commend your policy team for, you know, coming out and, you know, having a policy and working with the Keep It On team and with the Access Now team, and particularly on shutdowns. Um, so one question that I know that team has is, you know, does Twitter plan to include blocking and filtering information in your transparency reports? Yeah, you know, we would love to to be able to do that. I think um, there are some technical challenges with us being able to do that in the sense that we don't always know what's happening um, just because we are seeing lower traffic or um, some issues with access that can be a bug. It could be, you know, other bandwidth related problems. So part of the struggle for us is just making sure that we have accurate data. But if we felt that we had accurate data, I would love to be able to do that. I mean, in many instances, I think these are largely public anyway. So being able to consolidate and show this in one place, I think is important. But, you know, what we've seen is like we don't often know when a government is throttling our service and um, or we can't prove it. And that that's a difficult part of the transparency here. Uh, okay, uh, I know definitely the Keep It On team would definitely would want to work with you on that. Um, so um, that's what they do with other social media platforms as well. So it's in, the, in terms of verifying, you know, figuring out if it actually has been blocked. So um, I'm sure they're listening and will definitely will definitely reach out. Um, so um, I, I know we have about like seven minutes left. So um, I, I want to ask this question of. Um, um, so yeah, yesterday there was a bunch of people having a conversation about content moderation on on Twitter and other platforms, and you know what has significantly come out is uh, how we you know that are termed in the global south are disproportionately um, you know treated differently than the rest of the world uh, in terms of the way that content is reported, in, in terms of you know how the company responds. For instance, I know you have uh, one individual in your policy team for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I, I don't know if you've hired more, but at least that, you know, we're very happy that at least that one individual is there now. Uh, well, compared to what you have in the US, compared to what you have in, in, in Europe and even in Asia. So 
Um, I definitely have always this feeling that we're an afterthought and, you know, maybe that we're, in terms of market, we're not valuable right now, but in the next few years, you know, uh, we're going to be where the market is because of just how many people are being connected to the internet. So, um, you know, how would you respond to that from a policy point of view? Um, you know, um, I, I know that the features that are available, for instance, in the UK when you're reporting content are not available in Nigeria. Uh, the features that you're reporting on in content in Ethiopia are not available, um, you know, um, in, in other places. So how, how do you see that? Are we an, are an afterthought when it comes to policy or we're always on your mind? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm I'm not sure what you mean by the features available in the UK are not available in Nigeria. So that that's that's surprising to me. So I want to make sure that I follow up on that. As I, I I think we we were talking about before we got on screen. One of the great things for me about um, coming to RightsCon every year is is um, the learnings that we have in terms of um, how we can do better. So I want to make sure I understand that in a little bit more detail. Look, I don't think any any market is an afterthought for us. Um, certainly, our investment needs to be different and better all around the world. Um, you know, where we, I think you're referring to public policy when you say we have one sub-Saharan per person. We generally have, um, you know, our policy folks um, located in places where we have offices. We're just opening our first presence in um, Africa. So it's, it's not a, an issue of what's important or not important, it's just, this is we we haven't had an office um, represented in Africa, which is obviously a huge um, and exciting thing for us. Uh, we we really hope that this represents to the market our investment and interest in in doing this right um, and bringing more resources in terms of content moderation, in terms of safety, in terms of understanding the needs of the market in a much more granular way than we have before. So um, I would say that like. Part of this is is really um, being open to like doing things differently than we have. We've had a very centralized model in San Francisco for a large part of time. Um, our CEO Jack Dorsey has told us like we cannot possibly serve the customers that we want to serve globally unless we are with them and and from you know represented by them and like they are part of our company. And that's why we have this big push as a company to be decentralized, um, to be located in the markets, have employees representing the, the regions in the world where we want um, or we have customers. So that's one of the most important things that we can do is actually continue our investment here and make sure that we're understanding the very specific needs of, of all of these places because we're not uh, we're not going to be able to do any sort of effective job. Um, in either our policy or our enforcement, unless we have the perspective that we need from from all of you, from the markets we serve. So that is that is a big challenge, and I would love to have more resources. Trust me, if I if I could. But we do, as much as I think um, the the reality, is, as much as the the view is that we have unlimited resources, we just don't, and we often are having to make um, some challenging choices. But I would say that like Africa in particular right now is is one of the areas where we're investing a lot and we want to make sure that we um as a on my side on my policy and trust side that we're investing effectively to match the what, what we're seeing in the product and engineering side right now okay thank you for that um i know we have only about like two minutes so not a fair question but you know what does the future look like from where you're sitting oh i kind of hit on this earlier which um Look, I think we've seen this great um, shift, right? Uh, if you think back to the advent of social media 10, 15 years ago, um, so much power in, in how uh, people were able to use it to disrupt traditional power structures. And what you've seen in the intervening time is governments and others kind of trying to take that power back using various mechanisms, whether it is um, regulation or um, getting more savvy themselves about how to use um, social platforms or in, in some cases in some parts of the world, manipulating social platforms um, through operations or the like to really um, you know, take back some of that control that they've lost. And so um, what you're seeing now is, is that state, which is governments and others taking back that control and um, often at the cost of um, our activists and um, you know, people in markets. And I I think what we're going to see is a push towards more decentralization because centralized platforms are not serving the needs um, in many instances of, uh, you know, uh, particular groups or particular um, uh, particular voices in, in different parts of the world. So this is what we are, we are anticipating is a push to decentralization. We're very much focused on this um, in terms of 
trying to be a part of this change versus stopping it. We want to enable this. So we are pushing to set up a, a, um, a decentralized open social protocol. We call this Project Blue Sky. Um, we think that this has a lot of promising um, promising aspects to it. We're not sure exactly how it will play out over the next you know, three, five, seven years. But we do think that there is something about decentralization um, that is going to be very important and powerful as we kind of um, enter kind of whatever the next state of, of social and social media is. Great, that's that's really good to hear. I hope you know this this um, as as we're experimenting at least trying to figure out what what a decentralized internet looks like. You know, there's um, good impact assessment on how you know human rights will be affected, how freedom of expression will be affected, how folks like myself and Palestinians, you know, Dalit women and many others that are at the margins and at the front 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 of this conversation are are going to be impacted. I think the success of uh, you know of your platform is really giving voices to the voiceless and in, in many ways to many of us when we were not able to speak. So we hope that continues, but with a lot of due diligence and attention to the delicates and context uh, that matters. But thank you so much for joining me today. This was a really lovely conversation. I hope you had as much fun as I did, all of you. Uh, thank you so much, Jen. You have an awesome day. Thanks for having me. It was wonderful to spend some time with you all. So, okay. Have a good one.